Good morning. We are exceedingly fortunate to have Mary Lou Jepson join us. Uh, she's become a, a, a passionate advocate for focused ultrasound. And by any measure, she is one of the most important figures in disruptive technologies that could impact the diagnosis and therapy and improve access, decrease cost, and improve outcome for many medical disorders. Her career has been incredible. She's been a professor at MIT. She generated more than 100 papers and patents in the last five years. She has held very senior positions, executive positions at Facebook, Oculus, Google X, and Intel. She's founded four startups, including one laptop per, chi per child, where they mass produced millions of laptops for $100 a piece. She's the founder of a new company called Open Water, whose goal is to see deep in the body with the detail of a high resolution 3D camera. This holds the promise of being the ultimate game changer for focused ultrasound. She's been recognized with many awards, including Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, and CNN's Top 10 Thinkers. So join me in welcoming Mary Lou Jepson. Thanks. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm crashing the party because I'm not, you know, a, a doctor. That, not that kind of doctor, not the useful kind. Um, so it's great to be here, and I'm, I'm thrilled. Uh, at dinner last night, I heard a lot about the developments. I wish I could have been here all week. I felt like I... Oh, you know, what you're doing is incredible. I'm really excited about it. And I didn't know that I'd have such a gracious in invitation because, like, it doesn't make any sense that I'm here. I do consumer electronics um, in very high volume. I, um, you know, basically startup founder that ships stuff. I spend most of my time in Asia sleeping on the factory floors of the world and uh, hold up in hotel rooms reading papers to try to figure out a faster way to skip several generations. So I did that at, at, at Google, at Facebook, at Intel, at these four startups I started, and I spent a lot of time in school um, doing lots of physics and electrical engineering and computer science and um, art and stuff like that. And so really, th the reason I'm here is, is actually it has to do with uh, a thing I fell in love with in, as a teenager, holography which a lot of you might think of the little eyeball keychains back from the 80s. Um, but holography won the Nobel Prize in physics in the 70s for the amazing things it enables you to do with light. And I think that's why I'm here, because using holography, um, this is one of the first holograms I made. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. I got really into it. I went on to make uh, the world's first, with a group of, of graduate students, the world's first holographic video system. Um, it, it, you might be thinking still these little trinkets. Um, what holography enables you to do is capture the intensity of light, but also the phase of the light, which is the waves and the wavelength of light. And that's important because it's going to enable us to see in very high resolution inside of our bodies and leapfrog the resolution of today's current magnetic resonance imaging systems, PET, CT, you name it. And what's happened is sort of a trickle down, if you will, of Moore's law, the idea that you can double transistor density every 18 months, which is held true for 50 years, named for Gordon Moore, who coined it, the co-founder of Intel. And now that it's hit the lowly camera and display chip fabs, we're getting pixels the size of a micron, which is close to the wavelength of light, which means we can record the waves in the wavelength of light. And that's a really powerful idea. So 
Right, I've made a lot of displays and shipped a lot of stuff. Um, uh, m notably, I think Neil mentioned one of the projects I did as an MIT professor and got thrown out of MIT for doing this was to make a $100 laptop and figure out how to leapfrog the cost structure in the laptop industry. At the time, laptops cost about $2,000 plus the software you put on them, which was another $2,000. This is circa 2005. And I and my much more famous co-founder, Nicholas Negroponte, who was also a professor at the Media Lab, I had just left Intel, where I'd been the CTO of a division at Intel. Um, so I knew how to ship stuff already. Uh, we thought that if you could make a $100 laptop, you could transform the educational opportunities for children in the developing world. I mention that because there's an analogy here. MRIs are really expensive. Two-thirds of humanity lacks access to medical imaging. If we can lower the cost of medical imaging without reducing the quality, we could have some transformational effect on medical the way we were able to on, on education where we changed the equation, ultimately, of what a minister of education could do for their children in their country, where you would think here, sitting here outside of DC, maybe the solution here is better teacher training. If you look at a typical LDC, a least developed country, the bottom 50 countries as measured in GDP per capita, you know, there, Here's an example in a certain province, in a certain LDC I will not name. A third of the teachers paid to show up don't show up. The next third are illiterate. And so at best, you have a third of the teachers who know how to read showing up trying to do right by the children. And at that point, you have to use the tools of your time. So if you could make a $100 laptop, you could transform the educational opportunities. So we did it, despite the titans of industry. Um, thinking it was a joke, it would never work, publicly and privately deriding them beca us because if you could sell something for $2,000, you'd make more money than you sell it for $100. But basically what happened is we became the fastest growing consumer electronic category ever recorded, delivering $30 billion of revenue for our for-profit partners and leading the way, paving the way to the low-cost tablets we have now, Chromebooks and so forth that um, have made huge headway in schools. And so I mentioned this because how do we do that here? So yeah, here's, here's, here's where I live and breathe. Here's like what the factory looks like. That's when you're in final assembly. We had to make all new components for this thing because as hard as a $100 laptop is, my customers had very little access, steady, ready access to electricity. Same thing right now, right? Think of an MRI machine. You need a power plant to run it, liquid helium to cool it. You need space for a two-ton magnet, shielding. You know, there's a lot of infrastructure. Because this is the environment. These were the kinds of environments where our laptops were going. Where do you see any electricity <laughs> in this picture? So a small crank could power it up for a solar panel. So I've um, shipped a lot of stuff, and I was most recently running advanced virtual reality and augmented reality at, at Facebook and Oculus. And I left two and a half years ago, as I mentioned, because the manufacturing processes that we were putting in place from my vaunted position at Facebook, plus my colleagues at Google and Apple and Microsoft and Sony and Magic Leap and so forth, the, the, the power that we were having collectively to change some of the processes in the trillion dollar manufacturing supply chain to make next generation high fidelity virtual reality and augmented reality, I thought could have more impact on unseen on, on side of our bodies. And it felt like every single brain cell in consumer electronics was working on VR and AR, and I thought that was well covered. <laughs> and there was no one that was seeing uh, maybe what we could do to transform medical imaging. So that brings me to you. <laughs> so how do we take this big, literally big iron machine that you know literally saved my life. I had an undiagnosed brain tumor in 1995 when I was a PhD student in physics. 
at an Ivy League school in, at Brown University in, in America. And I literally filled out the paperwork to go home to die because no one could figure out what I had. And then on the way out, one of the med school professors sprung for the cost of an MRI. They found my brain tumor. It took 30 days to have a surgery. I had a good type of brain tumor, pituitary tumor. Removed my pituitary gland. Um, got healthy, petitioned to get back in to finish my PhD. I got the sympathy vote because I had a brain tumor. And they let me in. And I finished my PhD in six months and got $4 million with two other grad students to start my first company. So I was off and running. But it always struck me how expensive it was. And often when you talk about this, people are incredulous because you're, I'm, I'm in rooms like this where you can afford to be here. But a lot of people can't afford <laughs> this technology. And even, you know, in, in the case of PET and CT, there's radiation. In the case of MRI, now there's concern about the contrast agent, the gadolinium, and how many um, shots of it you can have over a lifetime. And so there's really a, a huge problem on medical imaging. I did mention the two-thirds of humanity that, that lacks access to it. So I started this company called Open Water. <coughs> to put the functionality of that big MRI scanner into a wearable, into a ski hat or a bandage, could be a bra if you have the BRCA gene, um, and basically putting chips like the type that I've lived and breathed and made for you know, the 35 years I've been hauling on making really innovative chips and, and devices and inline these kinds of things. So it sounds totally impossible, but it's really not. And so I'm going to explain to you quite simply how it works. And here's a laser. Um, red, light goes th red light goes through our, our bodies. So do huge magnetic fields, so do gamma rays, so do x-rays. But lowly red light, any kid that's like camped at night and taken a flashlight and cupped it around their hand knows red light goes through our bodies. So that's the first key, right? I already sort of. Uh, told you the second key. Oh, yeah, what about skull and bones? Well, light goes through bones and skull just, this, just as well. I bought this skull. I didn't bring it here. I bought it at skullsunlimited.com. It's real human skull. You can go there. But the light goes through it. And those of you who know optics will know um, black absorbs light, right? And white scatters light. It just scatters. And here's the thing, everybody thinks scattering is random, and that's, that's the clue. It's not, it's deterministic and reversible if you can record the face. And so really, um, it's pretty important to record the phase. And so I just want to say, like, not the whole body doesn't scatter the light uniformly. The blood, for example, absorbs the light and doesn't scatter it that much. The flesh scatters, the muscles, muscle scatters differently, and so we can see the properties of your body using the light. And we de-scatter the light by recording a hologram of it. In the case of this hologram, we don't just record the intensity of one angle. We record all of the light, the whole wave front of the light, holographically, every angle, every position of, of the light using this amazing uh, invention literally from the 1950s that somebody finally made work in the late 60s and the Nobel Prize was awarded for it, as I mentioned, in the early 70s because of the amazing things it enables you to do with light. And I think, you know, they say holography is a technology looking for a problem to solve and I think the problem that it can solve, the most interesting problem it can solve, is descattering the light in our bodies. Because it, the, and so I just, I spent the first 10 years of my career making holograms and the subsequent 20 making a lot of consumer electronics because, as I mentioned, I told you I'm a brain tumor survivor. I had to grow up to get health insurance because I'm American and <laughs> to live having been a brain tumor survivor. Otherwise, I'd probably be doing art somewhere. So here's how this system wor works and why I'm here again. We use focused ultrasound. So 
what I've done is here in the brain, these three black dots represent our, the integrated circuits that we're making, the camera chips and ultrasonic pings and the light that we're using. And so what happens is, for example, from one of the black dots, a, a focused ultrasound ping comes and it focuses down. And then I bring in the light. And I bring in the light later because of a fundamental reason that will seem obvious when I say it. Sound travels slower than light. So we want them to end up at the same place at the same time, so we bring in the light. The light that goes through that focused ultrasound ping changes color. It changes color ever so slightly, just like the pitch of a police car siren changes as it speeds past you. It Doppler shifts. And so what we've done is make a laser that's coherent enough so that as we switch the color, um, we can actually uh, exploit a property of holography by bringing in another beam of shifted light. And that is that only two beams of exactly the same color can record this hologram, the interference fringes. You, can, you can't record a hologram with one beam. The nature of holography is interference of these wave fronts so that you can record the phase. And um, what happens then is at this next, at the neighboring black disc that's got a camera chip in it, we record these interference fringes. You can see this striation. That is what microscopically a hologram looks like. The reason we need this very fine pixel structure that's recently come into being is so that we can record these fringes. It's only been possible basically now because of the process improvements that have been put in place for the next generation VR and AR. And that's particularly true in the infrared. Um, what Apple didn't announce about its latest iPhone and the front-facing camera with 3D sensing that has a dot projector. That dot projector, it's about 500 different lasers that, that image out stripes at 940 nanometers, the near-infrared. And 940 nanometers, you're opeg again. But there's a camera chip in there with approximately one micron pixels and 50% quantum efficiency recording that so that a picture doesn't unlock your smartphone, but actually you. So that's really great because we can use that technology that they've spent, they've poured, yeah, I don't know, a billion dollars into making that possible. We can use that technology to see inside of our bodies, which is incredible. Um, by 50% quantum efficiency, that's a super technical word. What that means is the light that hits the camera chip, the percentage that gets converted to electrons. In the near infrared region where your body is transparent, those processes now standard at the chip manufacturers of the world for the next generation smartphones, which ship at, these suckers ship at more than a million units a day. So the supply chain basically makes these. Um, you know, it's 70% quantum efficiency. So 70% of the photons convert to electrons that hit the camera chip. About two years ago, it was 7%. So that's pretty amazing. So we decode that, those, that fringe structure a lot like Rosalind Franklin decoded this iconic picture of X-ray diffraction to reveal the structure of DNA for the first time. Back in the 50s, that was super breakthrough. We can do that a million times a second with these camera chips that we've developed because the camera chips are now double stacked. What does that mean? Well, there's so much information in the camera chip that what's become standard, again, in the trillion dollar manufacturing infrastructure, the bottleneck on, on getting, the, the light, getting the information out of the camera chip isn't the input. The light goes on, you can get it in a microsecond. It's pulling the data off. And so you connect this analog, because it's recording light and converting it to electrons, slap a chip below that does the logic decoding image processing of you know, your face or what, whatever. But what we want to do is what Rosalind Franklin did, which is a two, what's called a 2D Fourier transform, a discrete Fourier transform, which if 
there aren't any electrical, are there any electrical engineers in the audience? It's okay. Oh, there are, okay. And if not, if you, if you have any friends, like, that's kind of like, you just do Fourier transforms the whole four years you're like undergrad. So, so like, it's just pretty standard um, thing to do. Um, and so what we do is we decode that and then we scan um, out with the next focused ultrasound ping, the next voxel. So that gives us that, if I just go back, that gives us one voxel of information. And then we scan the next one. So we scan it a bit like this. Say we focus, but we don't have to do raster scanning. We can focus at any point we wish to. We can look at a region of interest. It's software reconfigurable, so we could do a big chunk or a small chunk. We can go much faster than this. I slowed it down so you could see the rate. Um, it takes about a microsecond to record, and what we're looking at is sort of 100,000 voxels per second, although we can multiplex the system. Um, in our first systems right now, we're going at 100 or 1,000. We slow it down so we can debug. But doing that, these are the kinds of images we've recorded using optically mimicking tissue phantoms. So we started um, with dead stuff, um, just either things that we made that were the same as flesh or literally whatever was on sale at the meat market, pork or chicken or you know that kind of thing, and put it in our lab and scanned and, and put in um, opti optically identical things to vasculature or, or tumors. And we're able to see at about a half a millimeter resolution as we scanned uh, the systems. So that was pretty cool. But we also uh, looked at, challenged ourselves to find the limits of the optical system. Um, and I showed on stage live at TED this year us focusing through skull and brain to five microns. Seems impossible, but it's not because we're using holography. Um, this was the lab setup that we were using back then to do it. It's, it's, you probably noticed, like, huh, this portable? It's kind of big. And so here's the thing, like, when, you, um, when you're a chip designer, to get access to the fabs of the world that aren't R&D, you are required to pay millions of dollars to fab the chip. And that's not even the, the key thing. It's an opportunity cost. If you fab that chip, you better ship it, or you'll be thrown out of the fab, and you won't be welcomed back. It might take 10 years if you're lucky. And so what you do is you use existing components and you jerry-rig systems to make sure, for sure, your design is rock solid. So we've spent now two and a half years doing that with this kind of lab rig with um, you know, different optics and different systems. Um, you'll see in the center, there's a fixed focus ultrasound probe on a really big XYZ stage. That's before we made our phased array system. But what we've done is replaced that big rig with three fundamental different components, um, new kinds of camera chips that I've described a little bit with very high quantum efficiency. The other thing that they have is, hate to use the word quantum again, but a really deep quantum well. And so that's how many photons you can take per pixel. And the deeper it is, um, the better the signal to noise ratio is. That's actually also very important for 3D sensing. And what 3D sensing is really important for, not just unlocking your, your, your smartphone, but for next generation virtual reality and augmented reality, so that we can have Pokemon Go plus plus, which, sorry, I know it sounds crazy, but that's what has enabled us to have this technology. Is really like of the VR and AR systems out there, Pokemon Go by far and away got the most user engagement. Um, lots, you know, hundreds of millions of people played and played every day for a while. They passed. When you have to pitch, I, I used to be an executive at Google. When you pitch to, to Larry Page, you had to pass his toothbrush test. You might say, what's the toothbrush test? That's, will this thing you're pitching to Larry be used by masses of people once or twice a day like a toothbrush? And if it's, the answer is no, um, 
go back to the drawing board. And so, yeah, so that's the sad, that's the amazing thing. So the other thing that's really come about when I started this and started looking at using the focused ultrasound for, we call it a beacon or a guide star, because I shift the color of the light at a certain point, a voxel, a 3D pixel, and can pick up the structural information of that because I can see the change in color of light by interfering it with something that's that's um, also that same color and then look at that. It's, it's basically I'm looking at ripples on an ocean. Um, and that uh, is now standard manufacturing process in most what's called MEMS process, microelectromechanical uh, chip fabs, which first really came in the collective consciousness, I think, with work Texas Instruments did in the late, 80, in the late 80s and early 90s to enable projectors in most, uh, if those of you who remember this, we went from having overhead projectors and what they called foils, which were pieces of transparent plastic, to being able to plug in laptops and project our PowerPoints on, on a wall. And that was really enabled by these moving, literally moving almost little diving boards as pixels. So they were electrostatically deflected to be able to make, to make images. So those processes, um, MEMS, end up um, enabling us also to modulate sound ultrasonically. Rather than, as I started this, I mean, talking to the ultrasound uh, chip makers, they use these piezo materials and they polish them very well and then they, they sawed into the piezo material and poured rubber and it took like six months just to make a prototype and it was always a screw up and it was nine months and I'm just like, oh my God, how are we going to ever do this if the manufacturing is such this like craftsmanship little, you know, little companies doing it and we need to move it to the trillion dollar manufacturing infrastructure. And so that's really happened and you see a bunch of companies using the MEMS processes and the nice part about it is the frequency is software configurable, right? Because you can let it resonate however you want to from one megahertz to 20 megahertz. Yes, you get less penetration at 20 megahertz, but you get you know 50 micron focus. Um, as opposed to the, the one megahertz. And so that's happening and we're focusing and steering our, our beams plus or minus 60 degrees in one direction, plus or minus 45 in another, so we can scan out with ultrasound with a single chip where, where we, where we want to go. And the other really key thing that we've developed is lasers. Um, and Initially, the, the, with the dead animals and the optically mimicking phantoms that I've shown you, we could use what they call continuous wave lasers. Like, that's a continuous wave laser. It just keeps going. It doesn't pulse. That's okay for dead stuff. But um, with living things, which we want to do, we're alive. It's good to be alive. That means we breathe and blood moves through our veins. And to do that, we need to... Um, uh, take that image before the blood moves too much. And what we call it, you can see, I don't know if you can see here the speckle, probably can't that well, but what's called the speckle decorrelation, which is how much your body moves in time. We've measured, um, and we think you have about 100 microseconds to take that image before the blood moves substantially. Although if you look at the literature, even today, 2018, people swear you have 10 seconds. And I was at a conference this year and I went up to this professor from the Netherlands and saying, you can't do 10 seconds. And he, and he said, no, 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 you can. I went to a doctor and I asked how long I can put a tourniquet on a graduate student's arm <laughs> to cut off the blood flow, right? And the answer was two hours. So we came back to the lab, put some margin in, and said, 45 minutes. Nobody goes longer than 45 minutes. So if you put a tourniquet on your arm, you can do that. But if you did that on your neck, that would be called strangulation, and you know, it really wouldn't work. So we're like, let's solve the real problem. So we made a pulse laser, microsecond pulses, with the coherence that we need and the wavelengths that we need. And we can see oxy-deoxy, so the color 
of blood changes, whether it's carrying oxygen or not carrying oxygen. And we can see that it peaks at 720 for oxygenated blood and 820 nanometers, 720 nanometers and 820 nanometers. So we made a laser with those two wavelengths that pulses with the coherence that we need so we can see oxy-deoxy, the oxygenated versus deoxygenated blood, which is exactly what functional magnetic resonance imaging does, but with a two-ton magnet, we're doing it with a little pulse laser and some camera chips and um, ultrasonic chips. And so that's super cool. So um, some recent improvements we've had to the system are 10x less light needed because of the quantum efficiency. Um, we um, have increased the signal to noise ratio by 100x in the last six months, um, made it a much smaller scan, um, footprint and increased the, the scan speed. So right now what we have, I think we're about to scan our first rats this week. We've made a small system, we've got a small animal facility, we've passed all the ethical requirements of it, and we're scanning um, rats in South San Francisco um, at a <laughs> secret location. Um, and uh, yeah, we're scanning um, rats and um, then we'll get I think uh, planning for the human access. Um, this spring, we're making alpha kits uh, for next summer as we freeze our final architecture in a kit that will be a functional tethered prototype. So the, the wearable component tethered to a box as we decide what our first product is. Um, we haven't decided that yet. Luckily, my investors say, look, if you're making a portable MRI that turns out can read and write. Um, so from Neil and the Focused Ultrasound Foundation, I found we actually focus the, the, the sound to uh, the max we, we go, have gone to is a megapascal. And I'm like, oh, that's probably not enough for focused ultrasound. We do a megapascal max for a microsecond. And so in visiting the Focused Ultrasound Foundation last summer, I found, no, that's fine if we just do that for 15 seconds. So that's like a, from where I sit, that's a packaging power problem, which is relatively easy. So we could enable scan-focused ultrasound that could deliver, I think, value to this community that can also register and do the imaging at the same time. And we're trying to, we're trying to figure out how to help because, um, it just seems transformative what you are all doing, and I'm not sure how we can help, but we're running as fast as we can to make these alpha kits. So yeah, scan speed, um, I think I mentioned, uh, we can go up to 100,000 voxels a second. I think our alpha kit m will be orders of magnitude slower um, because what we're trying to do is put uh, uh, just a portable system together that, that some of our partners can play with and we haven't decided the exact scan speed. On depth, um, it seems we can go about a foot of depth from any side. Again, um, that's really constrained by the size of the laser we use in the system because the loss is constrained by um, the safety limits. You can go to 20 milliwatts per centimeter squared. For an obese person, I'm just going to say it, it sounds rude, but they have more surface area. so you can spread the light, it scatters anyway. It falls off with the depth of the system, the resolution, and then how many camera chips you have to collect the light. And so those are basically, it's a cost structure, how big of a laser and how many camera chips you use. Luckily, Asia Inc., the trillion dollar manufacturing infrastructure doesn't matter. It doesn't mind, rather, if we mosaic camera chips together because that means we just sell, they sell more of exactly the same thing. That's fine, as long as we mosaic it. So it's a modular system we're developing. The signal to noise ratio, I think we're gonna do some announcements and show uh, the images of uh, the rats that we're doing right now. At the end of this quarter, our goal is to match MRI resolution by the end of the quarter, next quarter exceed it. Uh, with the imaging. And so as fantastic as this all sounds, I just want to mention it just uses the tools of our time, which are consumer electronics, machine learning, big data. I didn't talk much about how we can use machine learning and big data so that we can do more scans for a lot less. When it costs a buck to do a scan instead of $1,000, you can do more of them. And you literally care in the scanning side about three questions. Is it getting bigger? 
is it getting smaller? Is it staying the same size? So in the terms of false positives, I think you can just watch it and scan more often with this low cost system. But thank you. I'm a little bit over time, so I should, should end there. But it's, it's a delight to be here. I'm here all morning and love to talk to you and learn what you're doing and see if I can be helpful. But thank you very much.